Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 194. What are the typical computer tasks you do manually every week? Could you automate those tasks with a Python script? Christopher Trudeau is back on the show this week bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We discuss a recent hacker news thread about frequently used automation scripts. We share the kinds of tasks we've automated with Python in our work and personal lives. Christopher shares a tutorial about building a micro search engine from scratch using Python. The post takes you through coding the components of a crawler, index, and ranker. The finished engine is designed to search the posts of the blogs you follow. We also share several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a news roundup, how a Polar's query works under the hood, using Python for data analysis, understanding open source licensing, summarizing the significant changes between Python versions, a robust TUI hex editor, and a lightweight data frame library with a universal interface for data wrangling. This episode is brought to you by Intel. Get open source snippets and sample AI apps to build and deploy faster. Visit intel.com slash edge AI. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher, welcome back to the show. Hey there. All right, so we have a couple news items <laughs> following our Rust discussion. It just keeps going. Uh, yes. So maybe maybe we'll start there yes. uh, it, with some news. It's a conspiracy. We're we're all we're all <laughs> going to be Rust Rust programmers. Just give it time. Yeah, so if you've been following any of the Python news, uh, there was an announcement of a tool called UV. This is a replacement for pip and pip tools brought to you by the creators of the rough linter. Like with rough, and as you might guess by his comment there, it's written in Rust and by all accounts is quite speedy. At about the same time, it was also announced that the folks who are bringing you UV, a group called Astral, are also taking stewardship of the Rye tool. So we'll provide you some links to the blog posts, both for the announcement and the stewardship stuff, as well as a link to the Hacker News thing where people argue about UV and whether they like it or hate it and all the rest of that kind of fun stuff. Yep. The packaging space in Python keeps being... Lex use the word exciting and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> sure. may, may you live in exciting times. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're going to get angry notes about the fact that that quote's wrong. The second bit of news <laughs> is something that seems to be becoming a regular feature of the show. Uh, so much so yep. that I've automated the announcement. Python 313 Alpha 4 is now ready for your consumption. And you can drop in a different sound like that two weeks from now when it becomes alpha five. Yeah, we're moving right along. So betas should be shortly after that. Topics wise, I have a lot of data science stuff. I, I'm kind of following my conversation with Wes McKinney and ended up looking at a lot of different tools over the last week. The first one I have is kind of a little bit of a survey of a, a couple posts from the Polars blog. We've talked about Polars multiple times on here. Polars is a replacement for pandas in some cases, and a lot of people enjoy it. It is, again, maybe we have a special sound effect for this. <laughs> it is written in Rust, has a lot of the same kind of tooling uh, as far as a data frame library. In this particular blog post, the creators of Polars talk about they titled it a bird's eye view of polars and this one's by gl peters and it really digs deep into how it works it shows the steps from how queries are done how it optimizes them and then the final execution it has a initial introduction to the whole thing sort of a quote there a good library abstracts away many complexities from its users Polars is no different in this regard, as it maintains a philosophy that 
queries you write should be performant by default without knowing any of the internals, which is great. Again, this idea that it's doing all this optimizing underneath the hood for you to you know make this happen. And so this is <laughs> letting you kind of peek under the hood a little bit and see what's happening. So they give a, a little bit of a flow chart. You write a query. It's parsed into what's called a logical plan. That's optimized into an optimized logical plan, which is then transformed into the physical plan, and then it's executed. And then they kind of go through that in the article and describe what's happening. They provide an example query, which is really nice. This one uses multiple data sources that need to be joined together. Then they go through the process, very common in data analysis of like, okay, I want to group that, aggregate it. And in this case, they're using a like a total amount divided by the difference. Uh, it's a taxi data set. So there's a difference in the pickup and drop off times, and then they do an averaging. And so it's kind of like a, looking at the average rate that is charged for taxis and so forth. And then they do a sorting of it. All of this is a lazy frame. It returns instantly, even though this data set is over 3 million rows. And so they kind of talk about, well, how does that happen? And this sort of lazy evaluation, this idea of how things are changed from a query itself and parsed into this plan and executed. And then they dig into the code. And they, if you've never looked at Rust code, this gives you an opportunity to look a little bit at what Rust code looks like. It gives a nice overview of, in this particular type of application, data structures, structs, enums. There is some private kind of stuff happening, declarations there, uh, which is interesting. And then it shows these steps, the query, again, written in Python as that example, the whole thing written out, um, optimizing into the logical plan and then the query execution. And two of the important optimizations, the projection pushdown and predicate pushdown and if you wonder what those are, I'm not going to dig into them. They're pretty detailed in this post. I think it's a great overview for anybody who's interested in that stuff. It's nice to see a library and now a company showing their work, if you will, and being open to what are the complexities they're in. And I think that's really neat. And then the second post is related to that. It came about the same time on, on their blog. This one is from the original author of Polars, Richie Vink. It is titled why we have rewritten the string data type and it shares how polars they've gone through and rewriting this whole string data type and strings are kind of a messy data type they're one of the reasons that pandas has had performance issues in some ways with the numpy data type of trying to figure out like well what do we do with that and it has always kind of been a, a python object until recent days they talk about their relationship with Arrow, and they've been a consumer of the Arrow 2 native Rust implementation, and they had forked it and made this thing called Polar's Arrow and trimmed down the implementation to what they felt was tuned for Polar's needs. They had more control that way and looked to refactor, and at the same time, it seemed like the Arrow spec was also moving in a similar direction, and they both kind of now are a little more similar, which is great. So they can kind of keep using a lot of the arrow spec there. It talks about uh, what is called a German style string type. You can learn a little bit more about what that is by reading into this. Other things that are covered, they get into the good and the bad of what's involved in encoding strings. Uh, they cover hyper slash umbra style string storage. They dig into details on changes and some of the benchmarks, which is nice. They can kind of show you what these changes have done across not only the two versions that they're showing, but also small, medium, and large strings. So again, if you're interested in data types, optimizing of these kind of systems and platforms, these changes are not so much user-facing. The only thing you got to worry about is just updating to the latest version of Polars to get the benefits of them. But I'm, I'm a fan of this stuff. I think it's, it's really cool to see this. I, I like that they write these up in blog posts, and I hope they continue it in the future. All right. So what's your first one, Chris? I'm starting with an article by Alex Mullis, and it's titled A Search Engine in 80 Lines of Python. Alex had recently started a new job and had to learn Solar, which is an open source search engine based on Lucene. And to better understand the ins and outs of search, he decided to write his own engine. And this article is about the design and structure of that engine that he built. 
His first goal with it was to help him find sites that are smaller and don't tend to surface on Google, uh, addressing what's sometimes called the small discoverability crisis. And the code uh, going with the article is available on GitHub, so you can follow along with the whole thing, uh, along with the blog post, if you like. Before digging in, he does admit that the 80 lines in the title is an oversimplification. Uh, He did write some companion libraries that he's calling into, but the way he puts it is the interesting part is the 80 lines. The first step in making a search engine is creating a crawler. A crawler's job is to wander around and collect data. Uh, For Google, the crawler is crawling the web. For other tools, it might be crawling internal sites at a company or different sources of data. Alex's crawler uses a list of RSS feeds that are from smaller sites that he has frequented, a little over 600 of them, I think, if I remember correctly. Once you've got the data, you've got to do something with it. Uh, The next part is a inverted index. This is a data structure that maps keywords to documents. So if you think about what you're searching on, it needs to figure out which documents have those words in it. Alex's engine uses a Python nested default dict to store keywords mapping to the URLs of the corresponding doc, as well as a count on how many times those words show up in the doc. When the crawler finds a doc, it parses all the words in it and constructs the corresponding index structure, which he's then wrapped in a class because, you know, objects. Hmm. With the index ready, now you want to figure out how to sort the matching responses for a given query. And this is the ranker's job. Alex goes into detail here with some math that gives me flashbacks to engineering school that I'd really rather not relive, and then shows you how to create a score for a document. And that score then results in the rank, and that's how you end up deciding which, th- which articles to show in what order in your results. With all those core parts in place, the final step is then to create an interface. Alex chose FastAPI to build a front end for his query system. And then he finishes off the post talking about features that aren't there, but could be added uh, and summarizes what he's learned. So all in all, if you're interested in how that tool you probably use every day of your life works, uh, search engines, then this is a good intro with Python as the basis for the examples. Yeah, I explored this topic briefly when I was starting to learn Python. And one of the resources that I, I looked at was uh, Udacity. I couldn't think of the name the other day when I was talking to you. And they had, you know, kind of a basics of Python course. And that was what they had you kind of build as you work through the fundamentals of Python, which is kind of interesting. This looks way more organized and curated <laughs> in a way and, and definitely way more structured. It's a, a little bit more of an intermediate project, but I think it's cool that he's giving you a, a jumping off point for customizing and also for your, for some of your needs. But yeah, it's a neat project. Yeah, and the fact that it's only eighty lines, right? So, like, it was, right. I, I, like you said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw a junior if you're just starting Python on it. And this <laughs> might not be the place, but eighty lines yeah. is something that's comprehensible, so it gives you an idea how it works, and and uh, so it's uh, some interesting code to read, if nothing else. Yeah, yeah. All right. So my next one is from one of our newer authors here at Real Python, Ian Eyre, and Ian wrote this great introduction into this topic. It literally uh, is what the title says, uh, using, if you're interested in using Python for data analysis, this is a great resource to get you going. It covers not only the concepts, which I think it does really well, and some of the tools, as I've discussed over the last several episodes, uh, are sort of interchangeable. There's lots of different tools. I'll, I'll mention another tool at the end. But then probably most importantly, some of the methodology and taking through it. And so He breaks this into not quite a step-by-step project, but definitely provides you lots of tools and examples to work through, gives you a data set to kind of play with. This particular data set is a James Bond, the series of movies for you to follow the the history of 007 across his film career. (laughs) And uh, it's a modified data set so you can work with it and go through these steps. Ian starts with giving you an overview of this workflow and all of these steps and understanding what is the need for data analysis, why there's a need for a workflow. He takes a moment to focus on really one of the more crucial areas that's given time. (laughs) I feel like this happens in a lot of uh, companies and anybody who's probably done data analysis and been asked by a manager or somebody in organization 
is, okay, well, what's the objective here? <laughs> what is it that we're trying to find out of it? It's really the most important question. Otherwise, you're kind of just smashing things together to see what remains or potentially throwing things at the wall to see what sticks. And if you have a, a, a core objective, you really have a much better way of figuring out the path and the flow to get there. Again, going through the workflow, he covers acquiring your data. This might be pulling things in from a CSV file. One of the things that I really like about this section is he spends some time talking about how to pull in things from other sources. So maybe you're pulling things from the web, so that might be like a JSON resource. So he provides a set of four challenges of these different resources. One is JSON, the other is, okay, what if the data is in an Excel format, which is very common? What if it's been optimized in something like Parquet, which is a, a very popular format for data science? And then one that I found really cool and I hadn't tried is right from Panda's web scraping from an HTML table. He talks about this little add-in that you can put into your particular environment that then allows pandas to do this, that you can just web scrape out of something from like an HTML table instead of having to go through multiple steps there, which I think is neat. <laughs> and then you get into the heart of it, which is cleansing your data with Python, which is usually about 80% of your time. He has, I don't know, is it nine or 10 different steps, uh, creating meaningful column names, dealing with missing data, working with financial notation, and then converting that stuff, correcting invalid data types, fixing inconsistencies, correcting spelling, checking for invalid outliers, and then other common things like removing duplicate data, and then finally storing that cleansed data as a, a data set and choosing how you want to do that. And then this is where a lot of people consider the fun part. I personally really enjoy cleaning data. I know I'm a weirdo. <laughs> I'm also the one in my household who likes to thoroughly clean things. Uh, I'm actually sometimes asked by my wife not to clean things because she knows it's going to take too long because <laughs> it needs to be done thoroughly if I'm going to bother to do it. So I'm a weirdo in that way. So it gets into the performing data analysis using Python. Uh, you perform a regression analysis. He talks about a variety of different things you can do there. Building a scatter plot, comparing, in this case, the different sources of uh, ratings for the movies, which is kind of fun. You know, comparing like Rotten Tomatoes versus IMDb. Do they have a, an actual relationship there? Uh, does it make sense? And then gets into a statistical distribution of the film links. So a variety of different ways to kind of do the actual analysis part once you've gotten through everything. And then uh, a little bit about communicating your findings. I really think it's a great overview. If you, again, are getting started in this realm of data analysis and are interested in using Python for it, I think this is a great guide. It's also a thorough practice session for anybody who wants to maybe practice their chops on this, but also it's a good workflow to use as a blueprint to build off of. So. Thanks, Ian. I think this is a really great resource. Don't start building your AI app from scratch. Save time and effort by visiting intel.com slash edge AI. Get open source code snippets and sample apps for a head start on development so you can reach your seamless deployment faster. Go to intel.com slash edge AI. That's E-D-G-E AI. All right. So you have a multi-part one like I had at the top here. What's your, your next set here? Yes, your multi-part were related and uh, <laughs> my multi-part is borderline schizophrenic, but uh, okay. there's a, I've got a, I do have a twofer. Uh, the articles aren't related at all, except for the fact that they're both helpful. They're both reference posts. There isn't much to say about them because they're reference posts. But if I just sort of thought I'd highlight them in case uh, these were things that might be useful to other people as well. Nice. The first one is called Understanding Open Source Licensing, and it's by Uma Victor. Uh, the article does a deep dive on the different kinds of open source licenses, why as a developer you might care, why the company you might work for might care, why those two things might be different. The article talks about uh, starts out by talking about the two common categories of open source license, permissive and copyleft. 
Permissive are things like the MIT license that more or less say you can do whatever you like, uh, typically with some limitations on liability. That tends to be MIT and BSD are the ones that are the most popular in the Python ecosystem. And then the copyleft group, uh, by contrast, are things like the GPL family of licenses. They have conditions on using or modifying the software, such as making the software and your changes available to others. Hmm. There's a deep dive on each of the popular types and their consequences. And, uh, you know, if you're new to this topic, the article gives you a good overview rather than just sort of clicking in GitHub and picking one randomly. Maybe you can understand what your choice is a little bit. You might be surprised at how often you might run into this in your career. A few years back, I was at a medium-sized organization that got bought by a very large organization. I won't say who, but the first version of their mascot recently became public domain. (laughs) That large organization didn't want any GPL in the org at all. So we ended up having to do a massive audit on all our code and replacing a whole bunch of libraries because as a big lawyer-driven organization, they were worried about the consequences of the GPL. So as a developer who works in these spaces and you're using libraries all the time, you don't have to understand all the ins and outs, but getting the basics can be helpful. If you really want to dig into this topic and the article's not enough, I can also recommend uh, there's an O'Reilly book. It's a few years old, but I still I think it's still kicking around. It's by uh, Lawrence Rosen, and it's called Open Source Licensing. Uh, we'll include a link directly to it in the show notes. Yeah, we talked a little bit about licensing with my conversation with Wes McKinney. We kind of dug into the relationship between, you know, the arrow format and how Apache mm-hmm. kind of tied to that and so forth. So and I know the the blog post that you are pointing to talks quite detailed about, about Apache licensing. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And, and uh, Apache is another one of the uh, uh, permissive ones. There's very little difference between Apache, BSD and MIT at, at the high level. Yeah. So yeah, cool. they tend to be compatible with each other. And on to the second one. Again, another resource-y kind of link. This is called Summary of Major Changes Between Python Versions. It's by Nicholas Hares. And as you might guess by the title, it covers the big things that happen in each Python version. So if you're trying to remember whether you can use the walrus operator, depending on what version your client's using, this is the page for you. Uh, As someone who writes Python educational content occasionally, I find myself going, oh, I need to make a feature. What can I do that? I need to make a note. As an example, I just finished building out a course on exceptions. I talked about the add note feature and it needed to be able to tell the people taking the course that, hey, you need Python 3.11 to use this or newer. So this kind of article is really helpful if you're having to dig into that. I've also used a similar article by uh, Ned Batchelder that covers more or less the same topic. But if the info you're looking for in, in isn't in one of them, it's probably in the other. So we'll link to both of them in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. And in the spirit of the show that inspired the name of your favorite programming language, I think we should rename our discussion segment to The Argument Room. How do you feel about that? <laughs> oh, are we going to have an actual argument? <laughs> we tend to agree with each other a lot, but I can pretend. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. Yeah, I, I guess I can be uh, combative if that's what we're doing here. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so that's leading into uh, our discussion <laughs> or argument. Uh, this one, I guess, is actually a little bit more of a showcase or at least a, you know talk about our, our history with it. We found a thread on Hacker News that talked about, actually asked the question, what Python automation scripts do you reuse frequently at work? For me. I wanted to talk about this partly because that was like the title of the the first Python job I had was automation engineer. And so I was writing scripts for a marketing department at at a bank. And these were big, long, multi-step processes, not like the data analysis article that I talked about earlier, where I was grabbing data sets, connecting other data sets to it, adding fields, cleaning, cleaning and more cleaning, and then narrowing the scope of that. And then finally, you know, sending this out to various destinations, depending on who was requesting this data set and and so forth. There was like sort of weekly jobs and monthly jobs. But yeah, it was really data analysis kind of stuff. And and these were typically done in like a Jupyter notebook type of situation. That's what, you know, other co- workers were using. And slowly but surely, I I thought about, well, maybe I want to switch these to being something I would run in the terminal. So I started to experiment there. But it was one of these things that, 
it was a lot of text and a lot of messy data. And so by me running it through Jupyter and doing it as a multi-step kind of thing, it ended up allowing me to see what was happening. And sometimes, you know, depending on the, the changes to the job, it was something that I would very often run manually. And then after that was working well, I could then go ahead and set it to, to automate it. On a personal thing, there's a lot of stuff that I do for Real Python. I, I do a lot of the video courses here. And so I've had the need to know, like generally, if I look at an f- entire folder filled with video files, could just give me the total, like how many minutes is that or hours and minutes? Uh, that was actually a handy script that I created. Which you should have um, told me you had because I went and wrote the same thing myself. <laughs> you wrote your same thing. Yeah. All right, we could compare. <laughs> I have you know other things that rename files and push things into different folders. I, I'm trying to work toward automating a few other things that I do often, which is like backing up stuff and pushing stuff to different repos and so forth. Uh, we do a lot of stuff through Google, and so I'm trying to find some things there. But I'm interested in this topic, like in finding other tools. Uh, I'm interested in making things a little more CLI friendly and maybe get advice on, you know, what do you think is a great tool for here? So you had a couple notes here. You wanted to mention maybe what was your uh, first Python program? Uh, yeah. So I, the, the you know, Python is one of those languages where like you've got people who are writing the, you know, the, the little 10 line script because it's it's the solution. It often ends up being glue. Yeah, yeah. The hack, Hacker News discussion actually talks about the, the, like uh, a lot of the stuff was just, I, I have these 15 things that have to happen in a row. So I write the Python that calls those 15 things and then I invoke it all from cron, right? So, and that's a, a common sort of usage. Yeah. That same company that I was at that got acquired, the acquiring company was concerned about the image content we had on a public photo sharing site that was one of our uh, subsidiaries. And the police got involved. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I had to I had to go and grab all of the content for one of the users for an investigation. And so my first Python script was named Delaus. And the photos were all in S3 buckets and they were in random places. And there was a database that essentially stored where this person's account was and where all their images were. And so this really just was, again, it was like 15, 20 lines of code. It grabbed a bunch of information out of a database, grabbed some separate information out of an Excel file, did a the equivalent of a join, and then fetched all that stuff off of uh, S3 so that I could burn it to a CD and submit it to the cops. So it's a weird first experience, but I... Yeah, yeah. (laughs) uh, Ignoring the context of it, I think it's a common thing that Python coders end up with, right? Like, you know, you're talking about, you know, having the, the script that does the little lengths I use a tool called Shotcut for doing a lot of my video editing, and it's got an export me- mechanism built in, and you can do mass exports, but you have to add a single file at a time. The export is actually sitting on top of an underlying executable that it calls, and it does give you the information to be able to call that executable manually if you want. And so I sort of semi reverse engineered that information out of its detail files and stuck it in a Python script. And so now I've got a file called Glinda that I go off and it grabs all of my uh, stuff and renders it for me so that I don't have to go through and, you know, click it over and over and over again. Clean up, I have something called CleanPy uh, that goes through and removes all the PYC files. So it gets rid of your Dunder directories and uh, any PYC files that are there before shipping them off. Because of running into problems with size limitations on email, I've got a script that looks at a zip file and reconstitutes it in chunks Hmm. so that you basically, it takes one zip file and turns it into three if it needs to be three so that each one's small enough. Chunkifies it. (laughs) You basically, and and each one's, rather than just splitting the file directly, there each is a valid zip. By itself. Yeah, by itself so that you can send it in in different email. And then I've got some non-work stuff. Um, uh, There's a Canadian radio station that uh, has podcasty things on it, but they insist on not putting it out in a format that is friendly to users. They want you on their site. Yeah. 
So I have, you know, reverse engineered their protocol and have a little script that goes off and grabs each of the segments from the site and downloads it so that I can listen to it the way I want. A couple honorable mentions that aren't Python, they're Bash. Uh, but again, same thing. It's like that quick and easy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I have something called Term Ruler that just gives me a ASCII color coded printout of the number of characters in a on a screen. And again, this is one of those video and resizing things. Like, I may need to make sure the terminal I'm in is 80 characters or is 132 characters. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so it just prints out the numbers, but then it color codes every 10 so that you can visualize quickly, visualize whether or not the size is correct. And the last one I've got is uh, I called it DZip. I find I frequently need to take a directory and, or several directories and turn each directory into a zip file. So it's basically just a wrapper around zip that you hand it directory names and it creates a zip. Uh, so, you know, a little bit of inside baseball. I send Mr. Bailey here files frequently that are demo code and script for different components of the video courses. I keep those in directories. So I go dzip, demo code, and zip. And then I get those three zip files and dump it there so that it's there, right? So nice. I, I, I think this kind of stuff is sort of inevitable. If you're a programmer, it's often more fun to actually write the solution, even if writing the solution takes longer than doing it manually. Uh, I <laughs> yeah. think that I think that's a problem a lot of us share. And I think uh, once you've been doing it for a few years, you end up with a with a small collection. If you're new to this and you're starting to do it, one of the things I would suggest is create like one GitHub repo with like directories in it rather than having to... You're, you're not going to create packages for all these because you're not trying to share them with your friends or make them useful to somebody else. Right. So like just having a my miscellaneous scripts repo, then you can you know put them in there. And then because what you'll find is even if you stop using some of them, you'll be like, wait a second, I used to... I did that. I've got some sample code somewhere. So... You know, even if you don't intend on reusing it much, uh, sticking it up on a on a repo is there's value in being able to track it for yourself, even if it's not for anybody else. Yeah, when I think about this topic, it immediately you know turns to Al Swigert's book, right? The whole automate the board yes. stuff thing. Yeah, and he definitely focused on that, and that was of all the books that they had about Python at the job I was starting that that was the one they had. It was kind of right. interesting that they were, that was the sort of practical set of examples of like, Oh, you want to try to do these different things. And, and I, I still think it comes up all the time. Do you have a particular CLI Python library that you maybe you've had choices over time or you've got one you no, always use? I'm, I'm old school. Arg parse. I don't use anything okay. else. Um, all right. So it's built in. And, and even that it was, uh, it took me forever to get to that because I, I had, I was intimately familiar with the old one, which was what opt parse, I think it was. And so even, even, get, even moving to arg parse took me a while, but, uh, okay. Django switched their command line mechanism to arg parse from opt parse. So I was forced to learn it. And, uh, <laughs> so you ended up moving so, along. So I it. ended up moving along. I've used other libraries in the past when I've had to like build things for customers and things like that. But usually when I'm doing it for myself, it's quick and dirty. It's help and the name of a file and it's three lines. And I don't usually have to okay. do much after that. Yeah. Right. You're not necessarily needing a lot of flags or anything explanations of things because yep. it's really just for you yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. as although, opposed to something that's a little more deliverable to like another end user than yeah. you're gonna want yeah. yeah although i will still recommend you know comments and things like that for yourself because i know when, when we said we were, <laughs> when we said we were going to have this discussion i went into my bin directory and went okay so what do i have in here and i'm like <laughs> what is that what does that yeah, yeah. do why did I write that? Oh, okay. So, uh, so yeah, uh, there were a couple, couple pieces of software that I found on my hard drive that I wrote and uh, I didn't comment and I had to read the code to understand what the thing did. So, uh, so yeah, a sentence at the top is valuable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's a great area to look at starting, you know, like if you're, you're a beginner, yes. solve something, you know, solve yeah. a, a little problem in your life. And yeah, you could do it in Bash, but but it's a great way for you to learn Python and learn, yeah. you know, okay, well, how does it handle files, which is a really yeah. common thing. You, and, you, you'll learn way more by solving a problem and you'll retain more of it than yeah. by some toy that, you know, uh, the site you're learning from uh, is teaching you. Yeah, without a yeah. doubt. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It's related to our discussion topic this week and can provide some more details on how to turn those Python scripts into an application you can share with others using a command line interface. 
It's titled Building Command Line Interfaces with ArgParse, and it's based on a RealPython tutorial by Leodanus Pozo Ramos. In the course, RealPython instructor and my co-host, Christopher Trudeau, takes you through what the Python ArgParse library is and why it's important to use it if you need to write command line scripts in Python. How to use the ArgParse library to quickly create a simple CLI in Python. You learn how to implement positional versus optional arguments, employ flags, add custom actions, and even how to add a subparser. If you're interested in making reasonable applications and tools for yourself or to share with others, a flexible command line interface is a good place to start. And Python's built in library, ArgParse, has got you covered. Real Python video courses are broken into easily consumable sections, and where needed, include code examples for the techniques shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. All right, well, that takes us into projects. It looks like you have a, a, a two-e. <laughs> if you will. Yes. Yes. Yeah, nice. So many, many moons in the past, in, in the in the darker ages, before the time where IBM decided to hand Microsoft the gift of NT, there was an operating system called OS2. It was 180th as good as OS360, but it didn't require a mainframe to run. <laughs> In this darker time, I wrote device drivers and spent a lot of my days and nights fiddling little bits and playing with serial interfaces. And one of my best friends at the time was a hex editor. Yeah, okay. Uh, hex editors are tools for looking at binary data, oftentimes a compiled program, or in my case, it was often a data dump from a serial stream. And as binary data can contain values that are unprintable on a terminal, for example, ASCII 8 goes bing, uh, you need to look at the data as a giant table of numbers. This kind of tool used to come with most operating systems, but now, you know, tends to be a bit more of an add-on. So, yeah, yeah. So my project this week is Hexabyte, which is a 2E-based hex editor, which is by a gentleman named Justin, who goes by the handle Thetacon. And uh, since I'm talking about it on the Real Python podcast, you'll probably guess this was written in Python, and uh, you'd be right. It's built on top of the Rich Toolkit, and which is part of that whole textual 2E family. So you can edit up to two files at a time in Hexabyte, uh, doing side-by-side -side comparisons. Uh, you can switch between a modified printable ASCII view, a modified UTF view, or the usual hex value notation. Editors like these usually have a column showing the address value for each row you're viewing. And this one lets you even change the format of that so you can do it in hex or, or in binary or octal or turn it off altogether. It has the ability to do searching for content, so it allows you to look for a particular byte of strings. So pretty much everything I've ever seen in most hex editors is here. Uh, snappy performance-wise, even though it's Python. So if it's the kind of tool you're needing, this is a decent one. Also sufficiently self-contained that if you're just looking for another example of how to code using a library like Rich, this is a good example of that as well, because it's a small enough project you can wrap your head around it. Yeah. At the time of the recording, version 0.8.4 had been released. It has a bug that I bumped into where I wasn't able to launch the viewer. Backing up and doing a specific install of 0.8.3 fixed the problem. Somebody had already logged it and it had been bumped a couple times, so I suspect it'll get fixed shortly. Uh, but you might want to, if you're playing around with it, you might want to avoid the uh, 0.8.4 version. Bugs happen, so no big deal there. And seeing as I started talking about my project as if I was an ancient storyteller, I'm going to challenge you to do all of yours in haiku. How's that? <laughs> well, I have a, uh, I have a different sort of language thing that's related to what you're talking about. I had a friend who really was into graphic art stuff on the Atari platform back in the day, the Atari ST, and that was my experience with the hex editor. We found a program but it was written in French and we wanted to change all the pull down menus so that they yes. made sense to him and yep. not to me. Yes. Um, and so I was the translator because I knew French yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at least high school and college. And so uh, we went through with the hex editor and edited all those pull down menus and those options and so forth and kind of made a, an English version of it using a, a very simple hex editor at the time. So that it was interesting. 
Yeah, if I remember correctly, like the tagging inside of MP3 isn't encoded either, right? So like you'd be able to... You could see like, the strings. You could, you, you'd could probably be able to get the strings in them. You'd be able to see the same thing, get your hex editor open and uh, go in and muck around with the uh, with, with your with your titles. Yeah, find the Easter eggs and other things that are exactly. in there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, so my project is something that I spoke about last week when I had uh, Wes McKinney on, we talked about a variety of different projects that he does. And I mentioned that I was very interested in this project, IBIS. And so I decided to dig a little deeper into that this week. Partly it was featured in Bycoders. I'm like, oh, nice. Okay, cool. Maybe I can talk about this a little bit more. It is similar to things we've already talked about. We've talked about Polars. We've talked about Pandas. IBIS is a another tool for data processing and and working inside this environment. One thing that it provides that's kind of unique is that it tries to be portable, which I think is an interesting term that they use there. IBIS has three kind of primary components to it. It's a data frame API. It has some similarities to not only Pandas, but also the dplyr stuff from the R world. Python users can write IBIS code to manipulate tabular data. It had supports so many of these backends, these uh, query engines, if you will. It has like 20 different ones that it can support so you can move your code you know, across different database systems and so forth. So it's nice if you need to have the portability to you know, move the, what you're writing as queries across them. It has deferred execution, again, that kind of lazy idea. So execution of the code can be pushed to the query engine. Users can execute at the speed of the back end and not worry about the local computer, which is kind of neat. Their goal is to be future-proof, the idea that you can write this code that, again, can be moved across these other solutions. It has a lot of flexibility. Things that I like right off the bat is, again, I've mentioned multiple times on projects that I've tried to install things and, and you know kind of like gone through the nightmare of trying to get things running and so forth. And this was super easy. Not only does it have, you know, very simple pip install kind of methodologies, but it has lots of uh, those kind of install methods where you have like the square brackets and you're saying, oh, I want to have it talk to DuckDB or I want to have it talk to MySQL or I want to have it talk to so forth. And it'll automatically install all the different hooks that it needs for that to go. So the, I like that about the the way that's set up. The documentation is really good. Again, it shares a lot of the same ideas that Polars has as far as like being more efficient. And it's just, I think in some ways, Wes and his team that work on it had a chance to have another stab at like, oh, how could we do data frames and and do this in a much more modern way? If you're interested in this whole thing, our conversation was very enlightening. Like he created Pandas at a time when it wasn't even really called data science. You know, it was more of this sort of, world of statistics data has just blown up in such a huge way since that time i really like the way the data frames show up in this thing they they have uh, a very polars kind of style where you actually can see the different data types and so forth one of the things i think it does really well is it has the ability to export your queries as raw sql and show you that information if you've ever written SQL, it can be kind of cumbersome. This can really be a way uh, around that and make it a lot easier and, you know, kind of be a nice, friendly interface for doing data exploration. So it's called IBIS. All right. Well, thanks again for bringing all these articles and tutorials and projects this week, Christopher. Yeah. See you next time. All right. Talk to you soon. And don't forget, Jumpstart your AI apps at intel.com slash edge AI for open source code snippets, tutorials, and more. Save time, deploy faster. Visit intel.com slash edge AI. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show again. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey. 
and look forward to talking to you soon.